and this is Richard Eidlin from Business for America. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for our business case for secure and accurate elections in Pennsylvania. And uh, we thank you for joining us this afternoon. We have um, a really stellar uh, all-star cast here of speakers with us this afternoon. And before we get going, let me just uh, quickly explain the purpose of the call. As a number of you may know, there have been lots of questions raised about the security and accuracy of the elections from 2016, 2018, and questions about the ability of the equipment that's being used in Pennsylvania and elsewhere to accurately tally and account for all the votes that have been cast. Also, some have expressed concern about the potentiality for fraud in elections. So in Pennsylvania, as is the case in a number of states, there's an active conversation within the legislature and also uh, prompted by the governor and a lawsuit that we'll talk about in a moment um, that has led to active consideration of purchasing all new equipment that would be in place by the 2020 uh, presidential election, November of 2020. So right now in the legislature, the conversation is focused on how to pay for that equipment and the balance between the state's responsibility and the county's responsibility. Um, and let me now turn it over to my colleague, Sarah Bonk, to tell you just a little bit about Business for America, and then we're gonna begin with the other speakers. Sarah? Thank you, Richard. And thanks to all the panelists for being here today. Uh, just a really quick background about Business for America. So. Um, some years ago, while I was still working at Apple, I was in the private sector, um, business person, as Business for America is uh, uh, trying to represent, um, I was working, I was volunteering rather, um, doing pro bono consulting for a number of different organizations um, that were working to um, strengthen our democracy, whether it was looking at money in politics or voting rights or ethics. Um, I got involved in a lot of different nonpartisan groups and doing what I could in my spare time to help them out. And what I noticed while there are a lot of wonderful groups doing terrific stuff was that the business voice by and large was missing and the kinds of pragmatic economic arguments for representative democracy and political reform were simply missing from the conversation. So I started looking around to see if anybody was interested in doing that. Was anybody um, trying to make that happen? And um, doing that with the idea that we could get an initiative going and maybe I'd stay at Apple and I'd be on the board. But one day I decided uh, that I needed to do this full time because there's so much work to do and this is such an important issue. Um, and that if we can help convince everyone, um, Americans, but especially legislators, that the interests of the business community are aligned with the interest of the public in having a well-functioning government, which depends on a well-functioning democracy, which means we have to have well-structured, secure, accurate elections. Um, we've all seen how elections have been run the last couple of years and issues upon issues. I mean, it's 2019. There's really not a good excuse for the problems that we're seeing today. And these are all solvable problems, but sometimes we get stuck on partisanship and political turf battles. And business can help cut past those partisan divides by bringing this third perspective and this a uh, common sense viewpoint that these are solvable problems and we can work together to do that. So with business having this outsized voice, we are hoping to make this argument that a well-functioning representative democracy is good for everybody, business and the general public, and that elections are a critical part of that. So um, looking forward to having this conversation and looking forward to your questions. And I'm gonna hand it back to Richard. Before I turn it over to my colleague, Steve Masters, uh, who's with Just Laws, a uh, law firm in Philadelphia, I wanted to just remind everyone to, you know, keep in, um, consider that election equipment is similar to uh, the, the it, it's really critical infrastructure, just as we would want to invest in our highways, our airports, the internet. We think that election equipment, because it's so critical to a well-functioning democracy, as Sarah said, is also something that we should count as critical infrastructure. So Steve, let me turn it over to you. Thanks for being with us today. And just by way of quick introduction, Steve Masters is uh, an attorney in Philadelphia, been practicing law for many years, works both um, sort of in the legislative and context, representing clients in uh, legislative initiatives, 
And in Phil in Pennsylvania, he's been working with Business for America for a number of months, helping us establish our presence on the ground and as our liaison with the business community there. Steve, thanks. Um, thank you, Richard. Hello, everyone. Um, great um, to be on this call. This is a very important subject, and I'm so happy uh, that we have all this audience. Um, so I wanted to just give you a little brief um, sense of what the landscape is in Pennsylvania on this issue. Um, and then we will we'll be hearing so much more in detail from each of our other presenters. So what we're really focused on um, is a mandate that's come from both the Trump administration um, and from the, um, the governor um, to upgrade all voting technology equipment in our state for the 2020 election. The Secretary of Homeland Security, Kirsten Nielsen, called for all state and local election officials to make sure that by the 2020 election, every American votes on a verifiable and an auditable ballot. And Governor Wolf um, made the same mandate last April. We are one of only 12 states that still uses primarily uses this voting technology that has no paper trail and no paper um, way of, of doing an audit. And we're the only battleground state uh, that is, uh, that's facing this kind of uh, important election in 2020 with such an um, unsecure um, infrastructure for voting. So the legislature right now is, is um, basically grappling um, as part of the budget um, with the funding formula for allowing, uh, helping the counties to, to pay for this new equipment. We'll hear um, much more about that from Jonathan Marks and, and, and other speakers. Um, and they're also um, confronting some legislation um, to challenge the authority of the state to certify and decertify machines and, and to push for this mandate. Uh, in fact, there was just a hearing yesterday that uh, Jonathan was at with, um, with Kathy Bookbar from the Department of State. Um, and so this issue is up um, right now, and it's really um, a, a perfect issue for the business community to weigh in on since it's, it's cybersecurity, the, um, the infrastructure that all of our businesses rely on is something that as business leaders, we grapple with and, and, and businesses understand how to keep um, that infrastructure secure and upgraded. So that's something the government doesn't tend to do as much. And so uh, we have found that the business voice is a critical voice that needs, to, that needs to weigh in to help our government, both the legislature and the executive branch, um, make this transition work for everyone. Steve, thank you. <clears throat> so let's get into some of the details now. Um, Ron Bandis uh, is in the Pittsburgh area, and Ron runs an organization called Vote Allegheny, uh, which looks at uh, access to the ballot, ba uh, election security, and uh, the well-functioning of the election system. Uh, Ron also has an extensive background in IT, information technology, and cybersecurity, and has written extensively about these issues in Pennsylvania and elsewhere. And uh, Ron, I believe, has a PowerPoint presentation that is going to take us through and help define what constitutes a secure election. Ron, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Richard. Welcome, everyone. I'm Ron Bandes with Vote Allegheny, a nonpartisan election integrity organization founded in 2006 about the last time Pennsylvania bought new voting machines. So what is election integrity? Uh, at its base, most basic, we're talking about voting, uh, account, making sure that the votes are counted accurately. We could expand that definition, however, and we could talk about making sure that the will of the people is correctly determined. And so what's the difference? Well, for counting votes accurately, we just have to make sure that we are capturing the data from the ballots correctly, that there's good chain of custody of the ballots, the tabulation of the ballots is done correctly, and that the results are reported correctly. But to determine the will of the people correctly, we would also have to look at things such as campaign finance, ad, uh, uh, campaign ads, disenfranchisement, and foreign disinformation. So what are the goals of elections? And notice that's plural. 
Well, the first and most obvious goal is that we correctly determine the winners of the races and put the, uh, put the right person into office. But secondly, and just as importantly, we need to convince the losers of these elections and their supporters that the election was fair. In other words, that it was trustworthy. And what makes elections trustworthy is not empty assurances. It's convincing evidence, evidence that is available to everyone and understandable by everyone. Convincing evidence is best represented with paper ballots, and as we'll see, voter verified paper ballots. Ballots can be hand marked by voters who have the ability to do so. Hand marked paper ballots are implicitly voter verified. The voter made their own mark on the ballot. Therefore, the voter knows what's on the ballot. They made their own mark. For voters who cannot hand mark a ballot, ballot marking devices will be used. These look superficially like the DRE, that is direct recording electronic voting machines that we use in much of Pennsylvania today. But instead of storing your choices directly in computer memory as the DRE does, the ballot marking device prints a paper ballot. That paper ballot can then be verified by the voter if the voter is visually able to do that and otherwise could be verified either with assistive technology or with a human assistant. Either way, whether we're using hand-marked paper ballots or ballots printed by a ballot marking device, all the ballots will be tabulated by the same ballot scanner. Paper ballots are not a step backward, as I often hear people say. New technology makes the scanner capable of seeing, oh, this voter didn't follow instructions so well and didn't completely fill in the oval bubble as they were supposed to. They made a check mark or, a, or an X. The new technology of scanners can correctly count those votes. Paper ballots provide direct evidence of the voter's intention. The, the voter either hand marked the paper ballot with their own marks, which can be re-examined after the initial counting of the ballots. It could be re-examined in a recount or in an audit, and we'll talk about those. Uh, whereas a direct recording electronic voting machine makes you trust that what it has put in its computer memory is correct. You can't see directly into computer memory. You can only see the computer's screen, and in between the screen and the computer memory is software and the software could be wrong, not only because of hacking, but just because of crummy software or because of machine malfunction. And finally, voter verified ballots enable meaningful audits and recounts. Our audits in Pennsylvania today are, are not as good as they ought to be. And particularly, if we, we, we can, really can't do an audit of any value at all if we have DRE voting machines because that data, as we just discussed, is not voter verified. And as we say in the computer business, garbage in, garbage out. No matter how good your analysis is, if the data going into the analysis is no good, the results have no meaning. Recounts and audits are slightly different. Recounts are used to ensure that the right result was achieved in determining the winner of a race, especially in tight races. Audits are primarily used to ensure that the machines work correctly although some types of audits can do both of those things. And particularly, I want you to remember the name risk limiting audits, because this year we're choosing new voting machines, but the next battleground is over good audits, auditing more races than we do today and using better audit procedures than we use today. One uh, Pennsylvania state senator has on his website, if the election system isn't broken, don't fix it. I would argue, that if we don't have voter verified records and particularly voter verified paper ballots, and if we don't have good audits that are meaningful, then the system is broken because we can't have trust in the election system. Thank you. Ron, thank you. So let me now turn uh, after Ron's description to, uh, to Susan Carty. And Susan is with the uh, Pennsylvania League of Women Voters and uh, has been working with the League on Election Security for many years, and also recently served on the Blue Ribbon Commission for Pennsylvania's election security. This was a commission set up um, after the 2016 election. So Susan has some really interesting insights into 
what constitutes security, what some of the flaws uh, are, and uh, the path forward to ensure that the state's election infrastructure is secure for 2020. Susan. Uh, thank you, Richard, um, and thank you for providing this opportunity today. Uh, as you know, the League has spent many years as a nonpartisan and nonprofit uh, but political organization. Just a reminder that we do not support candidates or political parties. There are over 2,000 members in Pennsylvania. We have over 700 state and uh, local leagues across the nation, and there are over 300,000 members and supporters nationwide. We've serviced approximately 10 million voters in 2018. We focused on election reform protection and education for 100 years. And back in May of 2018, the University of Pittsburgh Institute for Cyber Law, Policy and Security announced the formation of the Independent Nonpartisan Blue Ribbon Commission um, for Pennsylvania's election security. The commission was led by David Hickton, founding director of the University of Pittsburgh Institute for Cyber Law, Policy, Security, and also Grove City College President Paul McNulty. Support was provided from the Heinz Endowments and the Charles Spang Fund. The commission was hosted by Pitt Cyber and in collaboration with Verified Voting and Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute CERT Division. It also included commissioners representing key constituencies and areas of expertise. The full commission can be found on the Pitt Cybersecurity website. The League of Women Voters was proud to participate in that commission. I have a quote for you from David Hickton. Quote, he says, we know the vast majority of Pennsylvania's voting machines are vulnerable to electronic manipulation and have no paper backups to ensure integrity of elections. Giving voters in Pennsylvania and across the country access to trustworthy equipment is a civic duty of the highest priority. And a quote from Paul McNulty, this is not a partisan issue. We must not leave our elections and therefore our democracy at risk of cyber attack. There's no question that Pennsylvania's outdated voting machines must be addressed. The commission conducted research surrounding three crucial issues, cybersecurity of voting machines, tabulation and storage, cybersecurity of voter registration roles and databases, and resiliency and recovery of Pennsylvania's systems following a potential breach. I'm gonna give you some of the recommendations that have been provided as a result of this commission. One is to replace vulnerable voting machines with systems using voter marked paper ballots, as you've heard already. The Pennsylvania General Assembly, it's recommended to them and the federal government that they should be helping counties purchase secure voting machines. Recommendation three is implement cybersecurity best practices throughout Pennsylvania's election architecture. Another one is to provide cybersecurity awareness training for state and local election officials. Also to conduct cybersecurity assessments at the state and county levels and also to follow voter selection best practices, ensure replacement, that's sure S-C-U-R-E, that's the voting system. Um, and uh, as far as procurement and leverage, uh, and these were serious findings that the system needed to uh, really vet the vendors needed to be upgraded and developed more. It was a, a newer understanding of where there's some strengthening needed. Also suggested to employ risk limiting audits. Also to implement best practices throughout Pennsylvania cyber incident response planning in case there is a breach. Revise the election code to address suspension or, su or extension of elections due to emergencies. Still a couple more and uh, bolster the measures designed for addressing voting equipment related issues so that voting can continue even in the event of an equipment failure. And finally, the recommendation to enhance measures that are designed to address e-poll book 
related issues so that voting can continue even in the event of an equipment failure. The Blue Ribbon Commission released these final recommendations for reform and modernization yesterday, urging Pennsylvania to issue bonds to require audits and to create emergency plans to protect elections. There's a full 72 page report that can be found at www.cyber.pit.edu slash report. In today's world, it is critical that our elections are secure, accountable, verifiable, and resilient. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Richard. Okay, good, Susan, thank you. <clears throat> that, was, that was great information, and we're gonna come back to a number of those recommendations um, and, uh, and suss those out. So following on, on Susan's work, um, we now wanna go to um, Jonathan Marks, who's with the Department of State for Pennsylvania. And Jonathan is the Deputy Secretary for Elections and Commissions. And uh, if you wanna you know, find someone who's in the trenches day to day working on these issues, trying to sort out the complexities of deciding what equipment to be used and how to pay for it and addressing some of the concerns that stakeholders have across the state. Uh, that is what Jonathan's up to. So Jonathan, if you could uh, take it from here and give us a sense as to how the Department of State and the governor is proceeding to address these issues. Thank you so much, Richard. Susan, Ron, it's good to see you again. Uh, thank you, uh, Steve and Sarah as well. Um, so you've already heard a lot of the context and, and background. Uh, so I won't, I, won't, uh, cover, I won't cover that ground again, but I do wanna make a few points um, uh, over the next few minutes. Um, as is my nature, I'm going to start with the good news. Um, Susan did a great job uh, summarizing um, the list of the, uh, of, of the um, Blue Ribbon Commission's uh, recommendations for Pennsylvania, and I, I did want to mention that we're, uh, that we're acting on a lot of those things right now. Um, you know, a lot of our focus is on obviously replacing the voting equipment uh, that is currently out in the field. That's the number one priority. Um, but we are, we are, we have engaged with the counties um, and to do cybersecurity awareness training. In fact, uh, we worked with the County Commissioners Association last year prior to the 2018 election uh, to do some exercises with county uh, users of the statewide voter registration system, as well as other county staff that work in elections. Um, we've also partnered with um, our state partners, including uh, the, um, the adjutant general's office, uh, the local uh, folks uh, for the Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, as well as uh, Pennsylvania's Office of Homeland Security and the Federal Department of Homeland Security uh, to do assessments not only at the state level, um, but we're starting to do assessments out in the counties now. Um, uh, folks have been trained um, um, in the adjutant general's office to do to do those assessments as well. So we're making a lot of good progress, uh, but um, we there are things that we need to do that are that are outside of our control. You know, obviously any changes to the election code uh, are are require um, coordination with the Pennsylvania General Assembly. Certainly, the funding that is necessary to help counties pay for uh, more secure, fully auditable voting equipment. Uh, is, is also requires uh, appropriation from the General Assembly. Uh, and that's been a focus of a lot of our work uh, recently. Uh, it came up in the hearing uh, that uh, Steve mentioned earlier yesterday uh, before the uh, Senate State Government Committee. Um, and, and our focus has really been on trying to, uh, trying to make the case before the General Assembly that uh, funding is necessary, that it's appropriate for the General Assembly to step up uh, in this circumstance and, and provide funding to counties for the equipment uh, that they need. You know, obviously this is a, an expensive undertaking. Um, our estimate, the County Commissioners Associate, uh, Association's estimate, um, you know, goes, it's somewhere between 125 and $150 million that we're estimating it, uh, would be required to 
uh, replaced our voting equipment. At this stage, um, about $14 million uh, in federal funding has been provided. This is Help America Vote Act funding that was uh, that had been previously authorized and it was appropriated uh, last year uh, and driven out to the states, but that's just obviously a small percentage of what uh, Pennsylvania counties would need to update, upgrade their voting equipment. Um, I think uh, Steve uh, did a good job summarizing some of the threats, um, but you know certainly the fact that we are one of only 12 states um, and I can tell you too, the other 11 states, most if not all of the other 11 states are in the process of upgrading their voting equipment now. Uh, so we may end up being one of just a handful and we're certainly the only swing state uh, that if we don't move forward may still be using um, largely paperless direct recording electronic voting systems. Uh, so it's a priority for us. I think it's a priority for the counties too. Um, what, what came out of yesterday's hearing um, for, for optimists like myself anyway, is that uh, you know, our counties are taking action in spite of the fact that they don't yet know uh, where the funding is coming from. They're, they've, uh, they're taking the risk that they're going to have to uh, provide this funding themselves. Still nearly a third of the counties have already signed agreements with uh, voting system vendors uh, for compliant uh, voting equipment, meaning voting equipment that employ a voter verifiable uh, paper ballot. Uh, so counties are counties are taking leadership here, um, and and our goal is to is to convince the general assembly that what the governor has requested, um, which, which is basically for the general assembly to pay for at least half of, uh, to provide funding for at least half of the cost of upgrading equipment, and that's to the tune of 15 million dollars a year over the next five years. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to convince the General Assembly that that is, that is necessary and appropriate uh, thing for them to do to protect, uh, protect our elections. The risk, uh, if, if any of you did uh, catch any of the hearing or, or, or um, heard some of the news accounts about it, um, you know, the, the uh, Lieutenant Colonel Schaefer, who has uh, nearly, uh, I think, almost three decades of experience um, in U.S. intelligence and counterintelligence, uh, he, he painted a very stark picture about what the threats are and what the threats have been in the past and, and moving forward going into 2020. Um, earlier this year, uh, the director of national intelligence, uh, Director Dan Coates, uh, summarized the threat in his uh, statement to the Senate Select Intelligence Committee um, regarding the U.S. Intelligence Committee's worldwide threat assessment. Uh, and in that document, um, it was noted that that in, in the U.S. intelligence experts, um, it's their opinion that adversaries and strategic competitors like China, like Russia and Iran um, are refining their capabilities. Uh, and in addition to um, doing the kind of um, influence um, uh, that they did through social media in 2016, um, they believe that there's there's a possibility that they al also may seek to use cyber means to directly manipulate uh, or dis uh, or disrupt disrupt election systems. Excuse me. So that that's the challenge we're facing. Uh, and when we talk to counties, uh, Secretary Bookfar and I have have spoken, and a number of other staff. We've been touring the Commonwealth to speak to counties to talk about their concerns regarding upgrading voting equipment. And the number one issue, really the only substantial hurdle, is the funding uh, to procure that new equipment. So uh, that's the threat we're faced with. I'm sure I've taken up more than my allotted time, so I'll, I'll stop now. But uh, thank you again uh, for listening. Thank you for attending. Great. Good. Jonathan, thank you, thank you so much. Um, and we'll come back to some of those points. Um, we are expecting Representative Kevin Boyle from the 172nd legislative district in Pennsylvania, but I don't think he's with us yet. So we're gonna um, continue. And let me, um, let me. we have one question. Ron, Jeff Greenberg from Mercer County asks, um, can you please address the Georgia litigation that's arguing that BMDs cannot provide a voter verifiable paper ballot because the voter can't actually verify the barcode 
that is being tabulated by the scanner, et cetera, et cetera. And do you agree with that assessment? And if so, what would your guidance be to Pennsylvania counties that are considering BMD configurations? And Ron, maybe in the context of that answer, you can build on Jonathan and Susan's points about the choices that the state of Pennsylvania has in terms of acquiring new machines. Okay, I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, so first of sure. all, uh, in the question you said BMD, that's ballot marking device. And I should point out ballot marking devices are not necessarily only used for voters who cannot uh, hand mark a ballot. Some counties will choose to use ballot marking devices for all voters. Um, I, I believe that is not the best choice. That is going to be an expensive choice. If I want to have three voters able to vote simultaneously and I'm using BMDs uh, for everyone, then I need to have three BMDs and, and, and the expense that goes along with that, probably uh, in the vicinity of $4,000 each. If I want to have three voters voting simultaneously in a paper ballot, in a hand-marked paper ballot district, I need three pens and that costs 60 cents. So there's the cost issue. But as for the barcodes, it's true that some, but not all of the ballot marking devices put barcodes in addition to human readable text on the printed paper ballot that they produce. And the barcodes reflect your choices. And they do this because supposedly the barcodes can be scanned more quickly than uh, human readable text can be scanned. Uh, but particularly in light of the Pennsylvania election code, which says nothing about barcodes, um, it, it's going to be a bad idea to, to allow this. If the election code said, okay, you can scan the barcodes when you do the initial tally of the ballots, but in a recount or an audit, you must use the human readable text, the barcode might be acceptable. But for lack of that uh, law in the election code, we can't trust that they won't use the barcodes again in the recount or audit. And therefore, the questioner is correct that uh, we could no longer consider that to be a voter verified ballot because people can't read barcodes. So it's only voter verified if we're counting the same thing that the voter verified. Okay, great, Ron, thank you. Um, Jonathan, do you wanna comment on that at all as you are exploring the types of choices that we have in Pennsylvania for election equipment? Um, we have not mandated a specific model um, but uh, what we have told counties and what we've put in our standard is that the human readable text um, on those ballots that are marked with a ballot marking device is the official um, record of the vote. Uh, so in the event of um, a, um, an audit or a recount, they would actually be looking at the human readable text in terms of, of tabulating uh, those votes. So I think, I, think, I think Ron made a good point about, uh, you know, about the unofficial tabulation and ensuring, and, and, he's, and he's correct that that is not addressed specifically in the statute. Uh, that's, that's another issue, and, and certainly Susan uh, brought it up when she summarized the Blue Ribbon Commission's uh, report. Uh, what, what, we're, what we're dealing with uh, the reality is we have an election code that was written for the most part in 1937 and we're trying to apply uh, 2018, 2019 technology to that election code uh, and that's a problem. Great, great, good. And, and Susan, any further comments on that, you know, based on the Blue Ribbon Commission's results? Well, uh, oh, uh, uh, actually, Mar uh, Jonathan just really clarified that very well, and um, uh, particularly with the fact that we just have a, such a, a code that has not been modernized or updated as time has progressed, and it does create a difficulty for all, with the voters and the legislators, in dealing with the issue, uh, uh, particularly if you want to deal with the issue quickly. It, it may not be able to happen quickly because of, of those parameters. Um, I did hear, I did learn something today, though, just to add to the conversation, because initially, uh, I understand there was really only one voting system at a time uh, that was uh, recommended in the beginning, and now we're up to five. 
And I, mm. I just read about that today, which is a, a very good news because input that we had received a while ago was that some of the, the counties w felt they were too restrained and limited in, in, in what they could do in terms of what, what was uh, recommended for them to do. So this is very good uh, to hear. Right. That right. Yeah. And if I may, just real quick, and, and yes, that number has been growing. We expect overall there to be six oh, systems great. certified um, by the end. But um, yeah, last fall we had one. By the end of the year, we were up to three. And then by January, um, before the end of January, we had four systems certified. And then just within the last week, we certified a fifth system. So uh, that, that has been a challenge for some counties, particularly counties that, um, that may uh, have a specific thing in mind. We involved all five of the vendors and all six of the, the systems in our um, expos that we did across the state. We did five expos uh, to kind of give voters and poll workers an opportunity to come out and take a look at the newer voting equipment. Um, but as they were looking at it, uh, you know, they, they may have been leaning towards one system or another, and, and a couple of them uh, weren't certified at the time. So it's, it's good news that we've been able to complete that um, process and get them certified. Great. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Steve, let me turn it back to you. I did want to say yeah. uh, that uh, mm -hmm. State Representative Kevin Boyle is himself voting right now on the floor of the okay. uh, State House, which is why he um, was supposed to be able to to join us. The the session was supposed to be over about an hour ago, but it's it's kind of gone much longer than than expected. Okay, great. Yeah. So, Steve, th thanks for that update, and um, give us a sense of what our plans are for Pennsylvania and how those on the phone can participate, and uh, you know the the work we're doing to build a business constituency, you know, making an economic argument for updating our election equipment and, and other initiatives? Um, yes. So we um, are a new presence in Pennsylvania. Business for America is a national organization. We've created an advisory council for business leaders uh, in various regions of the state. Um, and so we, and that, that um, process is still ongoing. So we are looking for additional business leaders uh, in in southeast and and north central and um, south central and the Pittsburgh area and uh, a number a number of, of different um, regions and we are planning uh, to do events like this on the ground in some of those places uh, in in the next few months to to help um, ex educate the business community, tie in existing business organizations. We're working with chambers of commerce, with the Economy League. Uh, and and with um, you know businesses large and small uh, across the state on this, we're also um, uh, joined um, into a broad coalition called Keystone Votes, which is a coalition of organizations such as the League of Women Voters, all nonpartisan organizations um, that are working to expand um, the opportunity of voting uh, to reform our election system so that we can maximize voter engagement uh, and eliminate the barriers to voting that um, that we've discovered uh, that not just we but but that the experts have discovered ov over the years so this issue that we're talking about today is really just the first of a number of issues that we will be looking at and and weighing in on as a business organization to help um, lift up election reform and increase voter engagement and the reason we're doing this, um, Richard, as you, as you said, is because the businesses that we have gathered together in the, and the associations understand that um, the strength and the vitality of our economy, um, the success of our local businesses depends on having our civic infrastructure be as vibrant and as engaged as possible. Um, communities where there are more uh, more people voting, more people engaged in the process, uh, actually um, that lifts up uh, the entire community. It, it, it creates a lot more resources and attention uh, and, and, and it's a pathway um, towards prosperity. So the businesses that we've been talking to um, get that and are, are very committed to ensuring that um, our government 
uh, our legislators, our, our, um, our regulators understand that that the that the, the the vitality of our voting system, the the the, the um, protecting our assets, our democratic assets, is critical for Pennsylvania to grow, um, to for our prosperity and our growth, and and really as a as a um, as a direct um, source of of um, just even broader things like eradicating and and reducing poverty um, is tied in with. With all, with basically pr promoting and ensuring the greatest possible uh, engagement by voters across the this Commonwealth. I'd like to add something to that, Ron. That that's I'm I'm I'm, I'm sorry, Steve. That was very helpful and at, right in line with with what we're I think we're all thinking. Um, what I just like to reinforce is a, more of a philosophical concept: is the concept of trust in our system and lightly more 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 recently there's a there's been a, a few curveballs thrown at Pennsylvania in terms of of our system and we we don't want to uh, permit ourselves to be tainted with that because it's um, it reflects immediately in voter turnout uh, if there's trust lost or if there's a feeling there's no evidence provided by the state to secure the trust and to enforce trust and to maintain yeah. trust, voters do tend to back away. And that is such a critical action that affects the entire system, government in our state, without the actions of voters. So our, I would look at our, our view and our mission, particularly from our league standpoint, is to do whatever we can to help build that trust and demonstrate how it can be looked at with faith and deliberation. We also just got a, another question from um, Jeff Greenberg from Mercer County um, that I wanted to um, share and, and give a response to. Um, so Jeff says that um, he would strongly encourage Business for America to um, to basically reach out to the business community and ha and get businesses to become more um, friendly towards allowing their employees to serve as poll workers on election days. Uh, he says that the business community at the moment is reluctant to permit employees to take a day off to work the polls, and this could really help the counties to have enough workers uh, that, that would do that. I, I think that's a great idea, Jeff, and I think we will definitely um, add that. That's a really easy ask. I mean, it's- um, I can actually comment a little bit about that, Steve. Okay, um, good. If I may. Thanks. Um, yeah, I agree with Jeff. Uh, it's a great idea. Um, um, thanks for bringing it up because we can talk a little bit about some of the ideas that we have in the works. Um, we're very interested in having a corporate social responsibility program centered on representative democracy. How do we protect it and strengthen it? And uh, in the last election, 2018, we saw a lot of companies involved in the Make Time to Vote. Um, uh, it was an initiative and a lot of companies signed up. It was in the several hundred companies, including some big names. And basically they were committing to say, we're gonna make sure our employees have time off to vote. Some people gave them entire days off, um, or making sure that they were paid um, even for that time while they were uh, traveling to the polls and doing their voting. So that's great. I think that was a wonderful first step in the right direction and great to see the um, corporate sector uh, starting to dance around with this idea of how can they enhance civic engagement and also um, help strengthen democracy. So that's awesome. Um, from our part, we wanna take that to the next level and thinking about a number of different activities that uh, businesses could sign up for and get involved in. And certainly we've got that on the list that um, you know employees ought to be engaged in the community, engaged in civics, and that would include working the polls. And that um, you know, we wonder if we'll have some companies um, uh, support that endeavor. We think it's possible and uh, yeah, it's on the list. Thank you. I've gotten another update uh, that the, um, the state uh, house right now is undergoing um, some controversial, considering some controversial legislation that that um, state representative Boyle needs to be present for. Apparently, uh, they're just kind of running amok over there with with different things that are that are getting votes on and, and debates. 
uh, which is, I guess, what happens in a democracy and they don't always uh, follow the prescribed uh, time limits of when they're supposed to adjourn. Um, <laughs> I did want to say in terms of um, some of the other uh, action um, approaches that we're going to be taking, we, um, we are going to be placing op-eds um, and letters to the editor and papers across the state um, in support of this, um, the need to modernize and, and have secure election equipment and to have adequate funding uh, for the counties to do that. Um, we're also organizing a sign-in letter uh, for businesses to sign on to so that we can demonstrate the depth of support for, for this among the business community. Um, and uh, there, is, um, there are now two packages of election reform um, bills. One is in the Senate, um, and it's um, somewhat bipartisan. It's mostly Republican, and I think one Democrat at this point has signed on to it. And on the House side, there's also um, an, an attempt to create a bipartisan package of bills. And so we are uh, in, in conversation with um, our coalition partners to understand uh, there's quite a lot of bills in there, a lot, a lot of ideas, and, and uh, we anticipate that there will be some hearings coming up um, in the near future that we'll have some opportunities to, to engage um, members of the General Assembly with. Yeah, I had had um, a thought of some anecdotes, Steve, if I may, that I wow. think um, are interesting about election security. And um, kind of like, uh, especially in, in light of some of Ron's comments about paper and, uh, and integrity and that paper is not a step backwards. So um, the first story, first anecdote is a local election in New Jersey it happened some years ago. And long story short, um, there was an election, one guy won, one guy lost. And when the final tallies came out, the guy who lost, this was a small local election, like small, small. And he said, I have more friends who told me that they voted for me than you're saying I got. <laughs> wow. So he filed a suit and had those friends um, complete, they fill out affidavits and say, yes, I voted for that guy. My vote clearly was not counted wow. here. And what a difficult situation because they were using this direct electronic recorded system. There was no way to reconstruct that election, there was no way to validate the vote. And if they'd have been on paper, they would have that, that, that proof. Um, yeah. And then another, another, another yeah. anecdote on the other side um, for paper uh, happened here in California where I am. Um, there was a county that decided they wanted to have open source elections. You know, they didn't have the money to put a whole new system into place, um, but they wanted to do, meet this mandate. So what they did was they took every paper ballot that was voted on and they scanned it and made it into a document that could be shared so anybody could look at every ballot. Of course, ballots are anonymized. Um, and so that was their way of having an open um, and verifiable uh, election. So what happened was they you know, had the election, did their tally, this person won, this person lost, and they had all these ballots scanned and they said, if you wanna come down uh, to come to our office, the Board of Elections, will give you a DVD with every single ballot. And so mm. some, people, some people took them up on that. And so they uh, went through and counted the votes. And this is a smallish county. I mean, you couldn't do that in San Francisco County, but- um, With computers, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess eventually, there you go. Anyway. So, um, uh, but for to have that, to have that all, like every ballot fit on a DVD, this would be like a stack of DVDs for, for San Francisco County. But um, nonetheless, some people took them up on this. They counted the votes and they found that over a hundred votes were missing entirely, completely missing. And yeah. now that didn't change the outcome of any of the elections, thankfully. So it didn't cause uh, too much ruckus. But what they found out was that the software manufacturer had a bug in the system that they knew about and they hadn't fixed wow. it. And so that's just like an example of like why paper works, um, you know, and so though it feels uh, for some folks like, you know, it's less, certainly less space age, but it's going to be way more trust building uh, in the system over the long term. And I say that as a technologist, there's no, there's no software without bugs, I promise you. <laughs> All right, so we have another question, um, and, and maybe I'm going to throw this out to, to the other panel. Um, this is from Jamie Forrest. Um, is anyone discussing alternative voting systems like ranked choice voting 
it would be especially useful as primaries seem to be increasingly crowded. Uh, Ron, you want to take a first yeah, crack? So, at so Maine actually now does all their elections except for president using ranked choice voting. Um, some people may have heard of instant runoff voting. That is one type of ranked choice voting. There's actually many types. Um, this is complicated. There is, uh, there is a uh, theorem called uh, Arrow's Impossibility Theorem that says that there's five goals of elections and no matter what system you choose, you're only going to be able to achieve four of them at most. So no system is perfect. Um, I, I myself uh, do like ranked choice voting. The idea is that you would rank your, your choices. So in an election um, where you have more than two candidates, uh, Ralph Nader comes to mind, yeah. um, uh, perhaps no one gets a majority. Now, normally we don't care, right? Whoever gets the most votes wins, but in ranked choice, you would instead say that you have to have a majority to win. And if nobody gets a majority, then you take the in instant runoff voting and that type of ranked choice voting, you would take the candidate that got the fewest votes and you would look at those ballots, you would throw out those votes, you would look at those ballots and take the second choices. And you would continue to do this until somebody gets majority, which certainly by the time you get down to two candidates, uh, somebody has a majority. Um, not everybody likes this, uh, particularly for single winner races. Apparently it works better for multiple winner races, which we don't have a lot of. Uh, in Pennsylvania or even in the United States, but um, uh, the, the, the other thing about ranked choice voting is it isn't always implemented well, and you have to allow people to rank all the candidates. If there are seven candidates on the ballot, I need to be able to say my first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh choices, and some jurisdictions only allow you to have three choices, and for reasons I won't go into now, that actually can turn out bad. Right. I, if I may, yes. um, just to add to that, that, thank you, Ron. Um, I, it comes up most frequently. It, it has been discussed, and I, I think e in the past, even uh, we've had a couple of pieces of legislation um, uh, introduced. It, it comes up during these years, these municipal election years, because that's when you do have, particularly in large jurisdictions like Philadelphia, Allegheny, uh, where you have, uh, say, Court of Common Pleas, you may have seven or nine vacancies in the Court of Common Pleas and 50 candidates. Um, so it, it typically comes up in the context of, of municipal elections where you have local offices, where you may be filling multiple vacancies at one time, whether that be judicial or township supervisor, borough council, et cetera. Um, it, it's not often spoken about uh, in, in the context of a general election cycle. Uh, where, where in Pennsylvania, at least uh, with our closed party system, the, the two parties uh, have kind of dominated the, the November ballots. I was going to add a little bit of color on this too. Um, you know, I, I, living in San Francisco, we have ranked choice uh, here. Oakland across the Bay does as well. And it's exciting to have a state, um, an entire state um, working on this. So as far as ranked choice voting, something that I could comment on is it is pretty remarkable how it helps reduce the toxicity of elections and the partisanship of the candidates. Um, creating this incentive for people to find a sane center and appeal to more people is certainly a, a way to encourage a more representative system. And rather than what we have today, uh, there's so many polarizing um, uh, systemic factors. And the less, the more that we can stop the polarization and, and pull people in towards the center where people can find compromise, and where certainly most voters are, um, we're going to have a, a more effective system over the long term. That being said, you know, ranked choice voting is still pretty new to a lot of folks. There are other countries that have been using it for a long time, um, but it takes some adjustment. And it certainly was the case here when it was new, people were um, sometimes dismayed by the results. But once people learn how it works, uh, I'd say overall people are really happy with ranked choice voting. Um, so that's kind of like in general, philosophically, where Business for America is, the whole the idea that we can have less partisanship and more competition. Uh, competition in elections is a good thing, just like competition in markets is a good thing, right? It gets you better results over time. Um, so in terms of Pennsylvania, you know, we're love, loving working on um, secure elections from the standpoint that it, it, it's really topical. In fact, it's pretty urgent. 
And it's, um, it just feels so practical, like the, you know, the solutions are there and it's just a matter of getting this done and, and helping everybody get to the same page where they understand the risks and understand the solutions. Um, that's a part of this call is about. So, um, so we're starting there and, but we're not planning to disappear after we move forward with secure elections and audits. Um, there's a lot to do in Pennsylvania and also being a state where there isn't um, a ballot, um, you know, citizen-led ballot initiative, that means it's on us to work with the legislature to get things done. And um, so we think there's an extra opportunity to have the business community step up and help make some of these differences happen. And it's going to take time, you know, democracy uh, isn't, isn't easy. It takes eternal vigilance, right? And, um, uh, but we're, we're building a, a coalition that we hope uh, can be here for the duration and help, uh, help Pennsylvania modernize and secure their elections and have a system that is going to be better representative of the interests um, of the everyone in Pennsylvania and of course more broadly um, where we're working in the whole country. Um, Steve, did you have some fin finishing remarks? Yes, yeah, so I was just gonna um, do a little finishing remarks because it is five o'clock. Um, so I wanted to thank all of the panelists um, for um, a really, um, quite interesting and, um, and very thought-provoking presentation. Um, Richard um, Eidlin and Sarah Bonk from Business for America, Susan Carty from the Pennsylvania League of Women Voters, Ron Bandis from uh, Vote Allegheny, Jonathan Marks um, with our Department of State, um, and uh, Kevin Voile and Abstentia while he votes on many different things in the, in the General Assembly. So for everyone who um, was part of our call, uh, we have your email address and we will be sending you out um, a follow-up email that will uh, help you connect with Business for America and, and take part in the various actions that we're doing. And thank you um, for everyone who was part of this call.